Um, just first of all, I'd like to say what a great honor it is to come and speak here today. Um, and I've been so thrilled to come and hear the wonderful um, talks that have been going on this morning. I've learned a lot already. Um, I realize I've got the presentation before lunch. I'm sure you're all ready and I'm not sure if it's better to speak before lunch or after lunch, but we'll see. Um, and I want to thank Barbara for letting me use the National Centre slides. And I need to say that these are my opinions um, and not necessarily those of the National Centre. Um, so first of all, um, just let me put, why am I here? Why have I been invited to do this? Um, so you might be able to tell from my accent that I'm English, but I actually now live and work in Australia. I've been a practicing family physician since the 1980s, um, originally in um, England, where I practiced in a group practice in the north of England for many years, which was the best experience I've ever had of team-based care. And on an example of N equals one, so one GP in one practice, I would say we had some fantastic results around patient outcomes, patient satisfaction, and lowering costs at that time in that practice. Um, but like a lot of initiatives, the NHS had another uh, reorganization and the team-based care went out the window. No evaluation whatsoever. And that's the problem that we face in this area. Um, I now practice in Sydney in Australia. And one of the very interesting things, and we've talked a little bit this morning about different systems, different countries. Moving from one country to another, which had a very similar healthcare system, the amount of subtle differences there are that affect the way you practice are very interesting. And I think we need to learn from other countries, but also reflect back on what that means to our own countries. Um, I had to change the way I practice. And when we think of evidence, it was very interesting what evidence Australia uses in healthcare and what evidence the UK uses. We are very selective in the evidence that we use. And that's what I really want to focus this on um, in response to Tina. Her paper was a really good example of very fine scholarship, but it does raise these questions about evidence. So that's my little kangaroo. So just, um, just as an example, this is a section from a paper that was published in Academic Medicine in the year 2000. If I was doing a teaching session now, I'd ask you to shout out what you think the X's refer to. <laughs> so this is evidence that XXX improves the knowledge base, and there was no convincing evidence that XXS improves knowledge base and clinical performance. I'm not going to ask you, but the answer was problem-based learning. Problem-based learning was widely adopted in the Western world for medical education in the 1970s onwards. It is still there. We still have no convincing evidence that it is any better than any other form of education. But it was introduced on the basis of educational theory and experience of educators. So we are very selective about the evidence we use to drive change and in the evidence we expect to be generated before we initiate change. And just that's a quote from a workshop that I ran um, for the AMI conference with some very, very high-powered thinkers around evidence a few years ago, where we said, you know, evidence depends on the listener and the person who's defining it. So we've heard a lot this morning about definitions of IPE and collaborative practice. We also have to think, what do we mean by evidence? So what is evidence? Evidence is used to persuade, and it, it has these certain um, criteria. It's the facts, so the sort of facts that we've been hearing about this morning. Who's speaking? The credibility of the person, the scholarship, where that evidence has come from. So we tend to look at evidence in peer-reviewed journals, which, which really does, as Hugh mentioned earlier, exclude a lot of the world who's working in this area who can't write in English sufficient to get published. We also appeal to the emotions. And I mean, I certainly am a very, very passionate advocate of IPE because of my experience. Um, and I tend to appeal to the emotions of the audience often. But as was also it, um, added in 1969, it's an understanding of the audience. We pitch what we say because of the people who are listening. 
And we may well get up and talk very differently if this was a room of patients, families, and communities. Evidence-based practice is another movement that we've been working within for many years. And Sackett, in his original exposition of evidence-based medicine in 1996, draw our attention to the fact that we use evidence, but we also use our own experience, and that that was part of what we did. So leaving out the experience of people who've been working in this area for the last 30 or 40 years, it can be quite challenging. We are losing a lot of evidence because we're relying on the randomized controlled trials and the peer-reviewed papers. Um, we've heard a little bit about IPE. So the 39 studies that Tina was mentioning um, excluded those IPE interventions that lacked a concrete edu educational intervention. Some of those interventions were only three hours long. Um, I'm not sure that we can actually say they're very concrete. And they also excluded the influence of learning on the job in one's team. And that has been mentioned again this morning. A lot of what we do in the post-qualification space, and I'm sure those of you who are practicing clinicians recognize this, we learn a lot on our job. And that we don't necessarily learn by going to a three-hour intervention. We learn every day on the job from our colleagues and our reflection. So, sorry. So just compare. These are some learning outcomes that have been defined by the ABIM for residents. The, no, no one argues with these, but how do we expect residents to achieve them? If we think of competencies for teamwork, um, as defined by IPEC or CAMMEX, uh, CAMMEDS, how do we expect health professionals to achieve those? It's the same question. We use educational theory, we use expertise, we use evidence but it's very similar. Do we need to put a lot of effort into working out the best educational methods for those people to achieve teamwork? Can't we look at some of the evidence that's out there from outside our own disciplines, from education, from business? All of those things are left out if we just search around health professional terms. So we really, as well as being interprofessional, we really want to be interdisciplinary as well. So just coming on to randomized control trials, um, and there's a really nice um, uh, quote there from Cronbach of Cronbach's alpha fame. Um, we've heard a little bit about this. Feasibility considerations. Um, lack of funding for education research we just mentioned. And that was, well, our attention was drawn to that in a very recent paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was referring to medical education, but other health professional education has even less funding. Um, and there's a questionable ac ac sorry, applicability of research models derived from clinical research for the complex system of education about which we've been hearing this morning. Um, it's very difficult to do the same interventions in the same way to multiple people over different locations. Um, it is very difficult to control for variation. Controlling for dif differences in participants is what randomized control trials are doing. They do not randomize the other variables that are in place, and therefore they have questionable results. The most common type of intervention, again, as we heard from Tina, is highly structured CRM and team steps. And these are both around enhancing patient safety. Do we randomize learners to different models of IPE, or do we randomize patients to the teams that are learning how to do the IPE? Um, team randomization to an intervention, and then patients randomized to a team. Where does the randomization stop in randomized control trials? We know the limitations, we've heard about these. Um, we need to do longitudinal trials, we've heard that. But how do we control for other variables that are affecting patient outcomes over that longitudinal time? How do we know it's just the IPE that's doing that? How do we know it's not something else? 
It's very, very complex. It's really messy. Messiness is a word we've heard a few times this morning. Um, and it's even messier over time. We've heard about retrieving data. Well, sorry, Tina's paper, a lot of the outcomes were based on retrieval of data from the medical records. We all, well, I know as a practicing physician how inaccurate those records can be. However, that's an example of big data. And the National Center is looking at a lot of big data at the moment to work out some of the answers to these questions. Um, and we, the, one of the conclusions in the paper was that future research should focus on developing IPE interventions that teach patient-centered skills. Definition of patient-centered, what does that look like in practice? How do we know it when we see it? I've seen lots of people saying, I practice patient-centered care, which I think if you ask the patients, they'd probably be very surprised about. Um, role models, hidden curriculum, how do these affect the interventions that we pursue? How do we control for those? RCTs and other outcome-based research answer do and which questions. Does the intervention improve the patient or triple aim outcomes? And which intervention gives the best outcomes? But we heard Tina mention that there were some questions around the outcomes that she found in her review. Questions around why was patient satisfaction not improved? Um, in this intervention and, not, and, and it was in this intervention. We can't answer those questions if we only look at outcomes. We don't know what is working to affect the outcomes. The classic experimental design assumes causality. So this is a classical uh, randomized control design for a drug. Um, having been in practice for many years, I know the problems that we have even with randomized control trials for drugs. The number of drugs that have come through this process um, onto the market and then have been withdrawn within four weeks. I wouldn't like to remember how many that was. So even this isn't that useful. It's even less useful in health professional education. So another example here is we didn't need a randomized control trial to show that smoking caused cancer. This was a longitudinal observational and correlation study over many years. And I really recommend this paper to those of you who haven't read it. We couldn't do a randomized control trial around smoking. It wouldn't be ethical. Um, but we found out very, very clearly that smoking caused cancer. So we need to think of different ways of doing this. We need to look at all the methods that are out there and think of other methods that are useful in this very, very complex field. The type of review we heard about, and I know Tina was asked to stick very closely to a brief, but it, in, it really did exclude the qualitative methodologies, including ethnography. And we heard uh, Hugh mention the BEMI reviews. I'm part of the BEMI collaboration. I've worked with them for a number of years. And they include narrative syntheses and realist syntheses, as well as the types of paper that we heard this morning. Um, the, there were some really nice examples of the realist approach to evidence uh, published in the Journal of Interprofessional Care this year, um, which really uh, illustrated the method for looking for answers. Still not simple, but it's another way of doing things. So we know, again, we've heard that uh, education and teamwork is a complex intervention. It doesn't go like that. It goes like that. And if we just look at A and E, so we look at the input and we look at the outcomes, we don't know how we got to the outcomes, even if we show they're useful. We don't know which of those pathways the intervention went along. All we know is, is it useful? And as I say in education, when we're looking at evaluation of outcomes, if I have 70% of my students who do very well in an exam following an in a intervention, the question for me is, why didn't the other 30% do well? I can't answer that if I'm only looking at outcomes. And that's the same with uh, the, uh, uh, what we're talking about today. We still don't have an answer to what part of that intervention is working well and for whom. We are not working in a nonlinear fashion. So I would advocate for at least some of your time to look at the realist approach. Um, and I'm not going to read through this because I know you're all ready for your lunch now. 
Um, but the realist approach is looking at things slightly differently. It's not looking at, does this work, though that's important. It's looking at, why does it work? Why and for whom and in what circumstances? And it's looking at the mechanisms that are driving change and thinking about the context in which they're working. So if I do a, an intervention over here in Australia, in Sydney, in the University of Sydney, in this hospital with IPE, working with teams, and I show my patient outcomes are improved, and I take exactly the same intervention and I put it down in Indonesia where I spoke earlier this year, and they, they do it, and it doesn't work. What does that tell us? Very little. We need to know what the mechanism is that's, work, that's acting on the success of the intervention in one part and is not working in the other because we work across different cultures and in different locations and with different teams and with different professionals and whether the student's there or not and with different patients and with different cultural values. All of these things we need to take into account. So we need to be looking at mechanisms in context um, with some of the realist approach from Paulson and Tilly, which I think is a really, really good resource to look at. So it's an explanatory mechanism. How does something work? And we're testing theories of that mechanism. Um, so all of these things we need to know. What works in what context? Why does it work? Would it work elsewhere? What is the minimum input to improve the outcomes? What can we learn from other disciplines? And we need to think of the context. We need to think of team composition. We need to think, what is a team? What is collaborative practice? Um, some very interesting work came out of Birmingham in England looking at teams uh, within the several national health service hospitals where they asked the health professionals in the hospitals, do you work in a team? And all the people who said, yes, we work in a team, they then followed them around to see what that actually meant. And they found that those people who um, worked in teams that met frequently, that set their goals together, that looked at how they worked, that looked at what was making them effective, achieved much better patient outcomes than those people who identified as working in a team that hardly ever met, that didn't set, set goals. And they call one group true teams and one group pseudo teams. And the true teams had much better staff satisfaction um, and retention of staff as well as patient outcomes. So just someone saying, oh yes, I work in a team, we need to actually explore that as well. What do they mean by that? What are their team processes? How do we measure effectiveness? How do team members learn to work together? Is it on the job? Is it before the job? How much do they need to do before they get there? How much do they need to do together? Do they need to go off and do that externally? Can they do that actually in practice? Um, and what is the difference between a team and a collaboration? Um, and I refer very frequently to Scott's four circles of the differences between teams and collaborations and coordination and cooperation. Um, because I think collaboration is wider than a team. A team really is a small number of people. Um, and another example I use for that is um, a CEO of a fairly large company was asked, are you a team? And he said, of course we're a team. You know, we're all working together as a team. So then someone asked him, can you name every member of your team? <laughs> so you know, what, we have to look at teams and the wider collaborations that most of us work in. So IPE, I don't think IPE directly improves patient outcomes, just as medical education does not directly improve patient outcomes. There's something in between. Education should facilitate learners to achieve defined learning outcomes, which are applicable to clinical practice that improve patient outcomes. Education and practice need to be addressed together, as we've heard many times, and is the whole basis of the National Center um, and the nexus that of education and practice. And these three things are some of the things that are also uh, highlighted in the Institute of Medicine's Integrating Research and Clinical Care paper that came out this year. So uh, there are some examples of, of where you can go to look at things as well. And finally, just um, from Tina's conclusions, I would question how you can adequately isolate an IPE intervention from other practice changes. And is that actually ethical? We've not mentioned that. 
you know, things have to be ethical these days. Is it ethical to try and do that? How do we measure patient-centered team-based care, which is a complex concept? Um, observing team behaviors, how do we do that? Is that going to be a, a really good ethnographic stu study, or are we just going to use the behavioral markers of which there are many tools out there? Um, and we need to ensure that IPE interventions are evidence-based. Um, but what evidence are we going to use? As I said, that depends. It's very social, cultural. It's very dependent on who we are. Um, and we need to learn from the literature about educational processes to feed into this. Oh, and those are my ref few references. Uh, <clears throat>